Hey everyone, I'm Erin and this is the Cardboard Republic. We have a haul video. We have a Gen Con haul video to be specific. Well, mostly Gen Con. We also have a couple games that we got in after the convention, but we're going to start off with just our Gen Con pile. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly this time because there's a lot to get through and I want to make sure you see all of the cool stuff that we got. Most of it's games. Some of it's really weird. It depends. Ryan got the games. I got the really weird stuff, obviously. So let's get started. We're going to start out with one of the most hyped games going into the convention. And this Gen Con, there wasn't actually like a huge big game that we like definitely needed to see. But Mountains of Madness, if there was a game, was one of the bigger names going in. This is, um a lighter game than it seems. It's actually more of a social game than it is like a heavy Cthulhu thing. Every player has these different madness cards that they have to abide by during parts of the game and you're all trying to kind of figure out what each other's thing is but you can't tell each other so it's like Cthulhu meets social deduction. Anyway, um, it got a mixed reception, to be honest, and I think in part that's because it seems like it's going to be a heavy Lovecraft game, and it's just not that heavy of a game. But if you go into it knowing what it is, it's actually pretty cool. It's clever. So, Mountains of Madness. Cities of Splendor is the expansion to Splendor. It adds a bunch of new cards, these fortresses, special abilities, and cities. I love Splendor so much. This is actually, okay, I'm generally pretty mixed on expansions because I feel like if your game is really, really good, I don't always want you to go back to it. I sometimes just want you to like create something new, let the game stand as what it is, and let's move on to something different. But I love Splendor so much, and the game itself is very simple, but also has enough depth that I always go back to it. So I'm really excited to have an expansion to try out with the game. Outpost Siberia is a resource management card game where you are at this like outpost in Siberia, okay? And this storm comes through and everything goes horribly wrong and then there are monsters attacking and you have to manage all of your resources to try to survive. Seems pretty cool. Um, that bear looks terrifying, and I don't really like game tins because they get dented really easily and they're noisy, but, um, the game looks cute as far as, like, man-eating bears go. Samara is a relatively small building game. You are the foreman in this little settlement. You're trying to manage your time efficiently so you can build a bunch of things and also hopefully take a vacation. It looks super cute. I've heard that it's um, absolutely cutthroat and bloodthirsty. I actually, I love games with themes that seem like they're going to be adorable and fun but are actually like really, really vicious. That's just one of my passions is that juxtaposition. So I'm curious to try this. I find that when you have a really, really intense game, but the theme is somehow, I don't know, lighter or a little ridiculous, as in the case of Chicken Caesar, it kind of helps to balance out the overall feel of the game. So players can be kind of vicious but not take it personally. I hope that I can get through Samara like that. Based on what I've heard, not so sure. I might lose friends. Wordsy is a game that we actually previewed a while ago. It is a speed-based word game, but unlike a lot of other games where you have letters on the board, you don't actually need all the letters in your word to be out there. You can kind of create based on what is out there. So Wordsy is pretty fun. We're bad at it, but it's pretty fun. 
Saikatsu is another building game, but in this one, you and all of the other players are building a collective garden, and your goal is to create these flocks of birds and these rows of flowers, and it's supposed to look absolutely beautiful at the end. I haven't played it, but some good, good friends recommended it specifically to me, so I really, really want to try it out. Also birds. Aeon's End War Eternal is a standalone expansion to the base game. You can add it in, you don't have to. We also got two expansions that can go either with this game or with the normal game. So it's a cooperative deck builder game. Um, the catch is that you don't shuffle your deck, which is super different from most others. Honestly, the first time I played it, it took a lot to wrap my brain around that concept, but now I want to go back and try it again and again and again. Folklore! The Affliction! It's an adventure style game. It has some pretty cool minis. You are working to rid the land of evil, like you are in so many adventure games, but I... I I love adventure games. I even don't mind that as a trope. I'm curious to see where this stacks up in relation to ones that are maybe a little more dungeon crawly or maybe a little more story based. So I'm thinking like Mice and Mystics or something like that. I like to see how different games have different takes on the same genre. Dragoon is a game I feel like I've been hearing about in this house for a long, long time. Ryan tells me that we don't already have a copy, which is weird because I swear I've seen it all before, but it is a game where you are rolling dice and playing cards and stealing gold from villagers and from other dragons and burning those villages down. You're a dragon. So that's cool. Honestly, this is the total opposite of a game that I would normally be interested in. It's super, super luck-based. You kind of just have to go with whatever strikes you in the moment. You can't really plan a whole lot ahead of time. So I'm not sure how much I'm going to love this, but I know it was one of our nominees for our Daredevil category of awards this last season. It has to be good, therefore. <laughs> I'm just not sure if it's gonna be good for me. Head of Mousehold? <laughs> Head of Mousehold. Okay, Head of Mousehold is a very interactive game where you have to pay a lot of attention to what other players are doing, try to anticipate their moves, you're trying to support your mouse clan and get the most cheese. I would tell you more, but that's like pretty much all there is to it. It's a game called Head of Mousehold. What more do you need to know? Banana Bandits. Again, with the punny... Okay, so Banana Bandits is a game about guerrilla warfare. I hate everything. It's a game where you are competing with other players to have your little guerrilla thing scale this 3D tower to try to get to the very top. It seems pretty aggressive, but in that kind of classic game sort of way where... Yeah, there might not be a whole lot of planning to it. It's not like you're plotting for three turns to kill Ryan. It's just that you're, you're always fighting amongst yourselves. So again, probably not a game I'm going to want to play a whole lot, but it looks like something that would be really clever if you have um, probably not like young, young kids, but in that in-between sort of stage. Also, there are a lot of puns. Did I mention the puns? A lot of puns. Five Seals of Magic. This is a dice rolling set collection game where you're trying to basically... Okay, so um, the third Harry Potter, I think it was the third, maybe it was the fourth, the one with the Triwizard Tournament, that, that is sort of what this is, only it's set in a tower and they can't call it Harry Potter. But you're all wizards trying to be the best wizard and unlock certain parts of the dungeon for some reason. Why do they always want you in the dungeon? I don't know. It seems like a bad idea. Just go back to the library. You're trying to unlock the five seals of magic and become the best wizard that you can, Harry. Not Harry. Definitely not Harry. That owl. 
Definitely not a Harry Potter owl. Let me preface the next two games by saying that I have nothing inherently against restoration games. I think that the idea of taking games that were really popular in a lot of gamers' childhoods, updating them, and bringing them back so that they can be not only good games, but as good as people remember in their, like, nostalgic haze. I think that's a really cool goal. The thing is, though, I don't have a nostalgic connection to any of the games that Restoration has brought back so far, or that they've announced. I had never heard of Fireball Island, and that's the one they announced at Gen Con. So I think people are excited, and that's really cool, and I don't mean to downplay that. That said, I don't really care. I don't... None of these games strike a chord with me, and that is fine. I am not the audience for them. So, all that said, this is Downforce. Downforce is an updated version of Top Race, or it went by a whole bunch of titles, but essentially it's an old racing game that has been modernized for, like, you know, today's gaming audiences, where we do expect a little bit more sophistication from our rules, a little bit higher quality in our components than you did in, like, the 80s. Um, again, Downforce, not really my thing, but I haven't played a racing game in a long time. This is beloved by many, and so I will try it, and I'll let you know. The same really goes for Stop Thief. This is another restoration game title that was popular, I want to say, in the 70s. I could be wrong, but I want to say in the 70s. It was a game that at the time was pretty cutting edge. It used an audio component. It had a lot of plastic bits. And they've updated it and kind of kept with that same idea by making an app to go along with it. Essentially, it's like a memory-style deduction game where you're trying to figure out where the... the thief is. There are other games out there that do this. I want to see how Stop Thief does it differently and how it incorporates the app. I think that that's a really cool way to modernize the idea of what was so cutting edge at the time and keep it kind of cutting edge, although in a different way today. Again, though, I don't have any nostalgic connection to the source material, and so I... I am going to go into this a little bit blind. I do have a pretty strong connection to all of the source material in Millennium Blades, though, because that is, like, my era. The late 80s and 90s and early 2000s, all of the time that the Millennium Blades stuff is pulled from and spoofed from, that was what I grew up with. So this is the professional expansion pack. The guy on the front is sponsored by, um... Downton Moo. Mountain Dew, get it? The colors are the same. It's it's clever. I like it. I get it. I understand this. So I'm super excited. I also had the opportunity to have the artist for Millennium Blades draw me a custom card, and obviously I picked a snail. So I have that. It's actually serving as a bookmark right now, so it couldn't be here today. But I love it. And it's a snail. And I'm gonna play with it in my next game. But no one else gets to have that card. Hey, look, it's a dude on a box standing in front of a city. That must mean it's time for Aaron's Euro Game Corner, where this time you're building the capital city of Malta. In the same way that you build the capital city of every other country in Europe all the time. I honestly don't know what's different about this game compared to all of the other building things in Europe or colonizing and then building things in other places, games, but I, I also have kind of a soft spot for that whole genre, so I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt and say that it probably does something really unique and really clever, maybe, and I'm gonna try it anyway, we'll see. <laughs> Speaking of games that don't necessarily do too much different, <sighs> no, but really, this is Codenames Duet. This is a two-player version of Codenames in case you want to play two-player codenames and don't want to house rule it. I've actually have not played this, but I have seen it played. Um, it plays a lot like normal codenames, but there are only two of you. 
I kind of love that Codenames is one of the few party games that I can really get into. So while I like having the two-player version as an option, eh, I would rather play classic Codenames. I would like pretty much always rather play classic Codenames compared to any game that I'm playing. So Codenames Duet, still fun, not as good as Codenames all of the people around the table. I can't even with these monsters is a game that I bought solely based on the name and the artwork. Um, okay, so it's a game. You have monster cards. The catch is that the player with the highest odd number score wins. I can't even get it. There are other I can't even games. The monster one was the one that really caught my eye. I'm excited to try it. I don't know if I'll like it, but I will like looking at it. Okay, we also got, I think, five games that are technically imports, so I'm gonna go through those pretty quickly, mostly because a lot of them aren't in English, and I don't have the translations yet, and so I don't know what to tell you other than what the box looks like, which is universally the box looks amazing for all of them. <laughs> in this Rainbow Bird game, you are trying to build a rainbow bird by eating berries of different colors to make different colored feathers to make the rainbow bird, which is amazing. That's like a dream. Like literally, that's a dream. I don't know what it's called though. This is called Birdie Fight. It's another bird game. It has English rules included. Um, that's the only English sentence on the box, other than the title, Birdie Fight. Um, I will say, though, that the attitude displayed on this white bird, along with the title, Birdie Fight, makes me so excited. <laughs> so excited. Oh, and that bird's super angry. I love it. Those two birds. I'm Green Bird. Tag yourself, I'm Green Bird. <laughs> Mini Park is actually, they, there's an English description on the back, so what I'm about to tell you is probably accurate. Mini Park is a game where you are building a park for children to play in. You have to build playgrounds, and it specifically says that you have to build bushes for cats to hide in. This is literally on the box. Bushes for cats to hide in, ponds for fish, and like plants and stuff for birds. More birds, birds are a thing, I guess. But bushes for cats to hide in. This is the first game where there's ever been a thing where it tells you that this, you must accommodate the cats. Yes! Speaking of cats, Festival of a Thousand Cats is a game where you are the cats throwing a festival and you have to like resource management to make sure you have enough fish and also enough booze to support your cat festival. I don't know anything more about it because people explained it to me and then I was like, whoa, stop right there, take my money, you can stop, move on to your next person, I'm, this game is mine. Oh my god! That cat is cooking fish! That cat is cooking fish. Oh, that cat is eating fish! I don't know what that- Oh, that cat's doing a fan dance. Huh? Medical Frontier is also an import game, but is clearly very different thematically from all of the rest. In this one, you have to try to balance managing your resources with also advancing medicine and science and pharmaceuticals so that you can stay on top of all of the awful strains of disease that humanity is faced with. I should have started with this and not ended on it because that's a downer. Whoa. Let's go to talk about Vikings. 878 Vikings is in the same family as 1775. 
it's another game where players are on opposite sides of the war and they have to coordinate with each other to kind of uh, try to win but also try not to lose if that makes sense you need to make sure that your side is going to win but then you want to be the winningest viking obviously and so that is this game it is super historical and i i wish we just could go back to the game about the cats in the bushes oh god these two deckscape games are more escape room games which i love they are kind of the cheap but like not in the this is bad this is poor quality but just in the like literally this doesn't cost much money so we picked them up. I hope to play every escape room board game that exists. Um, that is my new life goal. I've quit my job and dropped out of school. Major General, Duel of Time, and Frontline No Comrades are both war games. And they're both war games with this kind of programming, action, taking, card, laying down mechanic to them. This one does it probably a little more seriously. I only say that because I can't imagine one that does it less seriously than this. Um, I haven't played Major General Duel of Time, but the way that the cards interact turn by turn as other things on the board shift is actually pretty interesting. <laughs> Frontline No Comrades, on the other hand, is... A struggle at high player counts we determined um but if you are only playing with like three players it's gonna move really really fast it is vicious it is cutthroat it is funny um it is super not serious <laughs> but don't play it with a full table or you'll be there literally all night and everyone will hate each other <laughs> Startups is a little game that we had a chance to demo at the convention, actually. And this is a kind of clever... I, I don't want to call it a bidding game because it's not really a bidding game. But it's like you have to... You have the option to buy these cards that come up in the center. If you buy a card, a company buy into a startup that no one else has, then that startup is not worth anything. But if you have the majority share of a startup that other people do have, then that startup is super lucrative to you. So it's this really clever little game about when to buy and when to sell and managing what other players are doing and keeping an eye on the board but also planning ahead. It's super thinky. It's a game that um, honestly this is not an intuitive style of gameplay for me but doing the demo I was really intrigued. I want to play it. Um, all of the startups are like animal themed. All the startups are animal themed and that's why I bought it at the end. <laughs> Indulgence is actually another Restoration Games title. I didn't realize that it was buried in our pile here. This is a trick-taking game based on a game from the 60s slash the 80s. It was sort of like reinvented in between there too. You have two options in this game really. You can follow whatever the leader says and things will go okay for you. Or you can try to undermine the leader and things could go really really well or really really poorly again trick taking game i don't know the source material so apparently people loved it enough for restoration to bring it back and that is one of their things they do bring back games that are loved i will try it but oh gosh trick taking games are like my second biggest gaming nightmare the first is social deduction games and the second is trick-taking games. I just, they do not click ever, ever. So I don't hold out much hope for me in this one, but we'll see. Tesla versus Edison Duel is the kind of distilled down two-player version of Tesla versus Edison. It keeps a lot of the major gameplay ideas from Tesla versus Edison. 
there's still a bit of drafting, there's still a lot of board control involved, or I guess game control, but it makes it manageable for two players. Um, I kind of struggled to get into Tesla versus Edison as much as I do, in that case, really love the source material and I find it fascinating. The game itself just didn't click with me. Um, I think it was actually something about the color palette being very, like, monochromatic and the game itself just didn't, it just didn't s spark with me. But I would be curious to try this. It seems to be kind of taking a Seven Wonders Duel approach to bringing this big game that's good for a bunch of players down to a manageable two-player experience. Um, like Codenames, but with Codenames I really love the big version. And with Seven Wonders, actually, I really love original Seven Wonders, don't really love Seven Wonders Duel. So, or Duet, or whichever one it is. But Tesla versus Edison, given that I don't really, really love the actual game, I want to see how this smaller version works for me. Rhino Hero, Super Battle, goes the opposite direction. It takes what is a very, very simple game and adds, like, a competitive thing where you're trying to build these buildings that players can't get out of and you're a rhino or a giraffe. Who cares? The game is adorable. Like, does anyone... Who here wants to be like, oh, well, she didn't properly discuss the rules to Rhino Hero. No. It's Rhino Hero. It's the super version. And if you don't appreciate that for what it is, for just, like, if you can't just look at this box and be like, I want to play that, or I don't want to play that, there's nothing I can tell you to sway you either way. You have to make this decision on your own. Are you a Rhino Hero person? Or are you boring. Sword and Sorcery, as you can probably tell by the box cover, is a classic high fantasy style dungeon crawly adventure game. It is set in a world where women have magical protection and they don't actually need armor to cover their vital organs. So that's super, that's neat. That's, I guess, a version of feminism. <laughs> Maybe. Um, Okay, this game is not for me. It is a dungeon crawler. One, I do not like those. Its artwork is um, like a sort of unbalanced, weird, old fantasy trope style, which I would honestly have a problem sitting down and playing with for the length of time that it probably takes to play this game. And now the box is really heavy and I want to put it down. <laughs> Cronia is a game about Politics, essentially. You are trying to appease the gods, but you have to be cunning and clever about it. That might involve placing your best offering at the foremost god's temple, only to realize that maybe you were wrong and that isn't the foremost god, and you have to switch and give them their your not best offering and move your best offering to another temple. And it's basically you are playing the American political system right now, but with like an ancient theme to make you feel better about your situation. <sighs> word Domination Spelling Disaster is a game about stealing the biggest words you can from your opponents. It is really clever and the whole noir spy novel kind of theme is not something I really get into in other forms of media. I don't read books like that. I don't tend to watch movies like that. But there's something about that genre as a whole that translates for me so well in gaming. It's so visual and the mechanics of it all work. And this game, I mean, it's clever. It's another one of those games, like I was talking about before, where it can be very cutthroat, but at the same time, the theme is light enough that it kind of takes the edge off. So we'll, we'll give it a try. I think that 
I've, I've heard good things, so I'm excited. Oath of the Brotherhood is not actually a cult game. Well, it's sort of a cult game, but it's a pirate cult, which is something I haven't seen before. Every year, this pirate cult decides that they want a new pirate cult member, and you are competing to be one of their members. So you have to be the best pirate that you can be. You have to recruit some crew and discover some lost islands and probably kill some things. I don't really know. Do pirate stuff, drink some rum. So all with the goal of being the best possible pirate, getting the most pirate points, and being selected to join the secret pirate cult. There's so much about this game that I don't understand. <laughs> but I'm excited. I'm really into cults. It's fine. <laughs> the last of our Gen Con games is actually one that we previewed like a year ago. Maybe more. <laughs> Fog of Love is a kind of esoteric game about playing through a relationship. Now, you can play this game very, very role-play style very theatrically, where you're making decisions based on what you think your character would do, or you can play it very strategically. Either way, though, Ryan and I played it, and we were like the worst couple possible. We were a disaster. If I saw me and him in my office for therapy, I, I like would have to go immediately to supervision and unload. We were uh, awful. But I think we did pretty well, like in terms of the actual game. So fuck of love, we're gonna try it again, hopefully. I mean, we do okay in real life, which I guess is what counts. Um, but this was actually one of the last games that we picked up at Gen Con too, kind of like on our way out. So I'm excited to see the finished version. I'm excited with most of the games that we got this year and we are going to stack them all up in a bit and see how they compare to me. We also got some non-gaming items at Gen Con. We got some really nice artwork in addition to my snail card, which I already talked about. I also got this cute bottle of tea and a bunch of other tea because it was me and they sold tea. And for the award of weirdest thing I was able to find at the convention, two sea urchin spines, which I bought. I think they were like 25 cents each. Um, the booth that I bought them from is the same place that I bought the moss ball in a light bulb from last year. So two years running, weirdest booth at the convention. Congratulations. Secrets is a game set during the Cold War. You are playing spies and you are trying to defeat the hippies who would probably save the world, according to the box. I mean, it, it's a very, like, ironic take on the whole era, um, which does seem pretty clever to me. I'm curious to see how that works in, like, today's political climate, where things are kind of a throwback in not-so-great ways to the times that were. Um, I don't know how swell this is gonna feel to play right now, but I do want to get it to the table and see maybe it actually works really well. Loot! This is an updated version of a game that Ryan loves. Seriously, he takes it with us like whenever we go away anywhere where you need kind of a small game, but you might not play it, but you might simple to teach people. Anyway, loot is the game that we bring. Um, this has updated art. It has a pirate who's a woman, which is pretty cool and new. and. I'm just excited to kind of play it again in like a new modern version. The old version is also awesome. There's no knocking it, but it's still pretty cool to see what they're doing to bring it a little more up to date. And finally, we did not actually get this at Gen Con, but I did demo it at Gen Con and it won my personal award for the cutest thing I saw in the entire convention. Gonuts for Donuts is a set collection game that plays basically exactly like Sushi Go, only you're playing with donuts, and I love sushi, but I really love donuts. So all of the artwork is adorable. <laughs> all of the artwork is adorable. All of the artwork 
is adorable and they're donuts and like you can't even really lose because what the loser just doesn't have the most lucrative donuts but guess what everyone ends up with donuts and now I want a donut and go nuts for donuts okay so that is our whole haul that is everything we are going to stack up the games we are going to see if all of the Gen Con stuff is taller than me. I predict that it is. If you went to the convention or if you participated in something like Gen Cant, I would love to know what you played during your little August vacation, staycation, whatever it was. Tell us down below in the comments. You can also head on over to our Patreon and support us in creating more videos and more content like this. And as always, please subscribe and like down below. YouTube is changing everything around, so maybe it's like up above now. I don't really know right now where it's going to be. You can also find us at CardboardRepublic.com, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on BoardGameGeek and Instagram. Basically everywhere. You can find us everywhere. Where there are games, you will find us. Bye!